boys down. Peace, everybody. Something happened with the live feature. It's all good. I'll troubleshoot when I get home. But for now, here, yeah, my baby in the back seat, waiting for my other baby to come from a trip in New Jersey. Went to an indoor theme park. But today, like the title says, is when I met Mano and Peter Rosenberg. Now, the reason I'm bringing up Mano is because Mano's on fire right now. Shout out Lobby Boys, Mano and Jim Jones. I love the, cal the, the, the collaboration. Brooklyn and Harlem always had a dope relationship. Even when I was growing up, I was always in Harlem. Stayed in Harlem, East 110th Street, right there by the, by the circle, by, by Schomburg Towers. My cousin Gene lived over there. I was always uptown, always going to Branson back in the days. But um, Mano, years ago, I uh, was running around my friend, real close friend, Lord Digger, um, one half of Blues Brothers Productions, uh, R.I.P. Norm Witch Doc Glover. Uh, Blues Brothers Productions uh, production team, they produced three joints off of Biggie's um, debut album, the Ready to Die album, uh, Everyday Struggle, Me and My Bitch, and... Um, one more chance. So during that time, like 96, 97, during the recording of the Biggie album, Ready to Die, I was running with Digger, actually. And um, we went to the studio like a few times, actually, during the recording of that album. And um, that's when I actually met Biggie. But that I'm going to save that for another story. But we went to the Hit Factory a few times. And um, so I was always around Digger at that time. Now, years after the Biggie project, I was still hanging with Digger. To this day, Digger and I are still cool. But I remember Digger went up to uh, SOB's because um, B.O.B. from Atlanta was performing at SOB's in Manhattan. And uh, Digger told me to uh, let's go up there. So I drove him up to Manhattan. We went to SOB's. And he said he wanted to go and uh, give some music or give some beats to Peter Rosenberg. And this is when he was still up on Hot 97. He was he had his late night radio show. Him um, and Ephraim, I think they had. Juan Epstein, uh, Cypher Sounds. They had their late night radio show. So Digger was giving them some beats to pass on to some people and also giving them some music. So, so when I went, we went up there and... Um, I always pay attention to what's going on in the industry, uh, read, watch a lot of interviews. Back then, it wasn't so as much as watching interviews because um, it was like reading magazines, Source Magazine, Vibe Magazine, Double XL Magazine, so on and so forth. Um, and I know, and, and I knew certain things about certain artists, and I, I think certain things stuck in my mind. Right, so when we got to SOB Park, went there, and there's, there's a lot of people there that night, you know. But I do remember um, BOB definitely being there, and I also remember um, what's his name, also Young Dro, I, um, I, I believe was down there. Doskin Cat, that was also down with um, Hustle Gang, he was down and he was signed to TI's label. So now. When we went inside, we we went to the bar. It was a packed night. And Digger saw Peter Rosenberg. Told him, this is my man, L. Introduced myself, Pound. And he was with his now ex-wife. And um, blonde girl, pretty. And then, um, so he's talking to Digger. And, um, you know, they're, they're doing their thing. They talking. Me, I'm just there chilling, you know, off to the side listening to some of the artists that are performing, listening to the music, the DJs playing. So I remember um, Rosenberg telling Digger, um, I'm supposed to see Mano. He's going to be here tonight, you know, and um, I'm going to introduce you to, and whatever happens, happens. So Peter stepped away with his girlfriend at the time. They weren't engaged at the time. And I remember telling Digger, I was like, yo, um, I saw an interview, I, I read an interview where Mano says that he, he hates talking to people that wear sunglasses indoors. So I was like, yo, 
I know you glasses, man. Because Dig is the type of guy to wear sunglasses at night. He's the type of guy to wear sunglasses at night while he's driving. <laughs> yeah. At night while driving in Brooklyn, New York, right? So I'm like, yo, man, I don't like talking to people that wear sunglasses indoors. He's like, what that got to do with me? I'm like, nah, nah, nah. It doesn't have anything to do with you. I'm just saying that the nigga doesn't like meeting cats that wear sunglasses indoors. So my thing is, look, you're in a position. I'm not saying to capitulate to the person. I'm not telling you to change your outfit. But I'm just saying it's probably a certain thing of a person wanting to be greeted someone eye eye contact you know straight up eye to eye contact you know that's what the guy probably wants and um so you know some time went on and i guess it was the time for peter to introduce him to mano so peter came by and then he was just like yo dio come through mano's over there so so we walk but i don't fully go over because i'm not meeting him you know, he's meeting them. So I go halfway, I stop. You know, there was music playing that I like, so I stop and let them go and do their thing. So I'm just there vibing to the music, drinking my drink, chilling. Now, when they go, Peter doesn't go with his girlfriend. His girlfriend now stayed kind of like near me, but then she went to the bathroom. So he takes Digger to go and meet Mano. They go meet Mano, boom, they talk for a few minutes. And then they come back. Now, when they come back, you know, I'm, I tell Digger how to go. And, you know, Digger just, Digger's Digger. He's like, hey, I met him. That, I met him, you know? And so I could see in Peter's face that it's like, not concerned, but it's like that look of where my girl at. So, I'm like, oh, she went to the ladies' room. She went to the bathroom. He was like, good looking. She went to the bathroom, and she came, and then, um, you know, she was talking to her. They were talking to each other, and then he went with his girl, and then they bounced. A little while after, B.O.B. performed, and then, um, and I and I actually liked B.O.B.'s performance because what I realized about B.O.B. that night was. He wasn't necessarily what you would call, uh, he wasn't just your average rapper cat. I found, what I realized that night was B.O.B. was an artist. And what I also realized about B.O.B. is he's smart because he was just talking. He was a smart dude. And later on in other projects, he would like reveal a little bit more of that intelligence. Like, yeah, you know, you have a lot of rappers that dumb it down, you know, but he didn't dumb it down. He actually, you know, he kept with his smart stuff, you know, and uh, I always appreciated that about him and other artists, you know, whether it's Cole, whether it's Kendrick, you know, if you're smart, you're smart. Forget about dumbing it down, you know, and um, yeah, but that was an interesting night. And ben, I remember Mano that night, he he was driving a, a Bentley GT Coupe, you know, this is easily 10 years ago, you know, and I was just watching his uh, interview on Math Hoffa's. Uh, my Expert Opinion podcast, super dope podcast. Shout out to the fellow Haitian brother, Math Hoffa. Uh, Math Hoffa, my, my god brother Menace is trying to get some beats to you. I believe you're familiar. Actually, Math Hoffa is a super real dude. On Twitter, I sent him a shout out a few months back. Menace coming home soon. He wants to get up at you. And he said on Twitter, hit my line. And I appreciate that. He's not too big to communicate with you, you know, on social media. But Mano had the, the Bentley GT Coupe that night. It was black with the camel interior, you know. It, it, all these little things is just so as if for verification purposes, people are like, oh, he's full of shit. Oops. Yeah, Mano, he was pushing the GT that night. But, um, but what I'm going to do since it's all related that I'm going to go back to Hit Factory the night that I went up there, it was for the session. It was for the everyday struggle uh, session. And I remember going to the hit factory with Digger. I was in the lounge room and the elevator was like a, it was like a freight elevator, 
going upstairs. And I remember uh, exposed brick walls, plaques all over the walls in the hallway going in. I remember being in the, uh, the lounge room, rolling up in the lounge room. They had the table and they had the TV and I'm rolling up. And Digger and Norm were in the sound room, you know, where the board and everything is at. And I'm and that and and Big came to the door, you know, just to check who's in this in, in the lounge room. And I'm sitting, and it was just like, not, not even a thought. It just came. I just automatically stood up. He just reached in, boom, gave the pounce. What up? What up? I sat back down, and he went into the sound room. Now, I'm not going to pretend that it was some super big conversation. That was pretty much it. But how many people can say that they actually gave a pound of Biggie Smalls? You know, so that was the moment. You know, now, again, three joints off the Ready to Die album. Classic, super classic album. And, you know, Digger's still getting checks to this day from that album. Um, nothing's been the same after Biggie got, Biggie got shot in California. But... I always remember that time period. I also, I'll probably be playing down the line on the channel some, back then you had cassette tapes. So Digger would produce the beats and then they would put the beats on tape. He would come to my house. My house was kind of like the G League or the NBA D League for rappers because my mom's in them moved to Florida. My daughter's bus is pulling up. Um, so that's the bus right there. It was like the G League. Because my moms and them, they moved to Florida. So I was like taking care of the crib. I was probably in my early 20s. We had tenants upstairs and I was in a basement. So most of the groups in the neighborhood used to come to the house because I had the producers that had the beats. Rappers just gravitate and just come. And iron sharp and steel sharp and steel. So cats was just coming to the crib to just get their work up. So there's so many groups at that time was coming through that ended up getting record deals, you know, Bushwhackers, Busted Melons, Bush Babies, um, Dreadnoughts, you know, uh, these, these, these are some people in the group members that were actually at the crib, you know what I'm saying, putting that work in, and it was, it was a dope time, and that's when actually I also caught a sample, because I had got some equipment, and I caught a sample, um, so I have a credit myself also on a group called, oh, The Cellar Dwellers, I have a credit on one of the albums uh, as a writer, producer, um, on a song called Medina Style. If you go and you pull up Cellar Dwellers, Medina Style, you'll see El Lubin as a writer. You know, so um, I never looked into if I got any ASCAP royalty checks floating around. I got to look into that, but you know. But yeah, very interesting time, man. But since my girl is just getting off... Uh, the bus from the school trip we're gonna cut this one short for now and we're going to continue a little later and um we're going to talk about some other stuff but yeah look out for the odd pod me and my god brother menace we're about to drop it the odd pod uh we got the odd odd media talk channel i'm gonna switch up from laugh rap life media we're gonna do it odd media talk and um yeah man that's it I appreciate each and every single one of my subscribers. I hope you're all doing well. Um, I never say this, but I gotta start doing this for, you know, growth of the channel. Hit the like button, share the video, subscribe, and I'll talk to you soon. Peace and love.